Okay, so the name of this session is Toward a Progressive Vision of Religious Freedom. And in particular, what we are interested in here today is the use of claims based on the free exercise of religion to further progressive goals. Now, in the past few years, that's not exactly the story that we've heard. Instead, mostly what we've heard about is the use of free exercise claims for exemptions from legislation or progressive goals in the healthcare space, uh, in anti-discrimination law as well. And we can think about those just by ticking off a few words very simply. Hobby Lobby, the religious exemptions from the Indiana anti-discrimination law, and Masterpiece Cake Shop. Now, let's imagine the alternative. Imagine a world in which free exercise exemptions didn't thwart progressive goals, but actually furthered them. For example, to provide aid to the undocumented, or to advance better climate policies, or to stop the building of a border wall. Well, these things are actually happening, the assertion of these free exercise exemptions. So today is about how they work, whether they work, and whether we should try to make them work. And that's to say whether it's a good idea to be claiming progressive exemptions, a robust free exercise doctrine, whether that's good strategically, whether it's good legally, whether it's good in the short term, whether it's good in the long run. And that's really what today's panel is all about. And ultimately, what would a progressive view of free exercise really look like? Now, to do that, we've got an absolutely awesome panel and I want to introduce them to you now. So right to my immediate left is Elizabeth Reiner Platt. Liz is a research fellow at Columbia Law School and the director of the Law, Rights, and Religion Project. Her work there in the realms of legal and public advocacy is geared to developing a thoughtful balance between religious liberty rights on the one hand and other fundamental rights on the other. Before joining Columbia, Liz was a staff attorney at MFY Legal Services Mental Health Law Project and a Carr Center for Reproductive Justice Fellow at A Better Balance. She received her BA in History from the University of Chicago and JD from NYU. And while at NYU Law, she worked with the Urban Justice Sex Workers Project, New York Civil Liberties Union, and Brennan Center for Justice. Next up is Serene Shabaya. Serene is the interim legal director of Muslim Advocates. Her work focuses on the Muslim ban, border searches, immigrants' rights, and civil rights matters affecting Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Her previous role was as the program director of the Virginia Justice Program at the Capital Area Immigrants' Rights Coalition. And there, Serene supervised criminal immigration cases before the immigration court and federal courts as well. Before that, she developed the ACLU of Maryland's Immigrants' Rights Program. And while there, Serene played a leading role in a wave of county policies prohibiting the detention of immigrants or ICE at local jails. Serene received her BA from the American University of Beirut, her PhD from Columbia, and her JD from Yale Law School. Moving right down, we have Bill Marshall. Bill is the William Rand Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina. He previously was Deputy White House Counsel and Deputy Assistant to the President of the United States during the Clinton administration. He has also served as the Solicitor General for the State of Ohio. Bill publishes on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, federal courts, and federalism, and he teaches constitutional law, First Amendment law, and freedom of religion, among many courses. He received his law degree from the University of Chicago and his undergraduate degree from Penn, Bill's a former member of the ACS, National Board of Directors, and currently serves on its Board of Academic Advisors. And finally, Melissa Rogers. Melissa is a visiting professor at the Wake Forest University Divinity School and a non-resident senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings. From 2013 to 2017, she served as special assistant to President Obama and executive director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Previously, Melissa was director of the Center for Religion and Public Affairs at Wake Forest. She has also served as executive director of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life and general counsel of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. She's also written a case book called Religious Freedom and the Supreme Court, which is about religious freedom 
and the Supreme Court. <laughs> she holds a JD from Penn and a BA from Baylor. So please help me in welcoming this all-star panel. Okay, so my hope today is this is gonna be a relatively free-flowing conversation, so I'll kind of prod with some questions to get things going, and then later on, we'll have the opportunity for your questions as well. Microphone set up for that, we'll talk more about that um, when it's time for that. So, in order to get us to a place where we can begin to understand the way that progressives are beginning to use these exemptions, we thought it would be helpful to take one step back and to see kind of what the state of the law is now, particularly with so many headlines during the past few years about conservative exemptions. So Bill Marshall has generously volunteered to kind of bring us up to speed on where the law is today in the free exercise area. So Bill, how do we get here? Okay, so pretend this is a nightmare in your bar review course because I'm <laughs> gonna give you all the detail you would get on the free exercise clause in a bar review course. Mm -hmm. It begins with Reynolds versus United States in 1879, which dealt with Mormons trying to get an exemption from anti-polygamy laws. The court rejected that. Part of the opinion reads like they were not even accepting the validity of Mormonism as a religion. But in the key part, the court said, look, we aren't gonna provide religious exemptions from laws because to do that would make every person a law un unto herself. Actually, they used himself, but that was the terminology that the court used. Flash forward to a case called, called Sherbert versus Verner in 1962, an opinion written by Justice Brennan, seven to two, which is what's considered one of the great hallmarks of the liberal Warren court. In that case, the question was whether or not a Seventh-day Adventist should be still eligible to get unemployment insurance compensation, although she couldn't work on a Saturday. And South Carolina law, like most states, required you to be available for work on a certain amount of days if you were gonna get unemployment insurance compensation. The court, uh, under Justice Brennan, said a burden on free exercise rights such as this one had to be supported by a compelling state interest. And at the time, there were really four reasons that were presented why there should be this kind of strict judicial review of burdens on religious exercise. The first one was sort of an <coughs> equality notion, and this, this is gonna come back later on, that you might expect political majorities to provide exemptions for themselves, so for example, if you had a town that didn't want to, that wanted to be a dry town, you might very well see an exception for people using wine for sacraments because there's a presence, there's a political force to it. Uh, with a lot of minority religions, uh, the majority might not be discriminated. I doubt South Carolina was discriminating against the Seventh-day Adventists in a, in a conscious sense of it, but they probably wouldn't have thought about accommodating Seventh-day Adventists. So the idea of creating an exemption would be to promote equality by addressing where the legislation, legislators may not have stepped in to provide the same kind of accommodations to minority religions as they would invariably provide to majority religions. That was, that was rationale number one. Rationale number two was a pluralism rationale, the idea that it was important to buttress uh, what was called intermediate communities, religious communities between the individual and the state as a way of weakening state power. A third reason, the obvious one, is a lot of people felt this religion was the primary, primary liberty. And religion, more than other kinds of, of liberties, deserved a special protection of this type. And finally, there were some who just made a textual argument. The free exercise clause has to mean something, and the way to give it some vibrancy is to allow it to work in this manner. Um, the compelling interest test that was created under Sherbet was incredibly vibrant. Um, there were three prerequisites. You had to show religious sincerity, which the courts didn't like to look into, so invariably signed off on that. You had to show that there was some burden on your religious exercise, again, an inquiry that the courts were uncomfortable with. And you also had to show that you were actually presenting a religious belief as opposed to something else, and in one case, the court said, if it's a philosophical belief, you don't get any protection, but if it's a religious belief, you do. But if you satisfied those three inquiries, you got to the compelling interest test, uh, which you all know in other areas of constitutional law, but was, should be at least theoretically particularly powerful in this area, because in other areas, you ask whether the state has a compelling interest, say, to prevent the use of hallucinogenic drugs. 
And the, the, the class you're looking at can prevent the entire society from using hallucinogenic drugs. But the way the free exercise clause would work is only, you would only apply the compelling interest against maybe in one particular case, the 130 members of a religious group who wanted to use a hallucinogenic drug. And the state's interest would be far less compelling against a small group like that than it would be against the society at large. So you would have expected most free exercise claims to win. They didn't. The only kinds that did, the only ones that won were a series of unemployment compensation cases that looked exactly like Sherbert and Wisconsin versus Yoder, which if you read Justice Berger's opinion is a homage to the Amish who wanted to have, <laughs> who wanted to have an exemption from compulsory schooling requirements in the state of Wisconsin. That brought the case up to Smith versus Employment Division in which the issue there was, and by the way, Garrett Epps has written a terrific book on this that I all, all, all mm -hmm. recommend on the facts of this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it, it actually wasn't about the Amazons. It was about... Uh, <coughs> uh, right, so we've, we've name-checked the Amish yeah. and the Amazons. Yeah. But, yeah. but it was, a, I mean, the, the, the tradition in question was a long-standing tradition among some Native Americans to ingest peyote. Um, Justice O'Connor said, well, there's a compelling interest here to allow the state to win. Um, three other justices dissented and said that there wasn't. And uh, the majority, and, and, uh, uh, but Justice Scalia's opinion said, look, we're getting rid of the compelling interest test. The only thing we're asking is one question. Is it a neutral law of general applicability? If it is, then you don't look any further. So they turned the free exercise inquiry into what is essentially an anti-discrimination question. If you can show that the law was intentionally discriminating against a religious exercise, then you get protection. But if it's a neutral law of general applicability, we don't care how it falls out. Some people might get harmed more than others, but the state wins. Uh, his opinion wasn't really the best when it comes to the use of precedent. Um, <laughs> He distinguished, he distinguished Yoder as a, I love this, hybrid rights. Now, the conservatives love to make fun of penumbras. <laughs> hybrid rights. Anybody who's ever read Madison on beefaloes and the use of hybrids, it's really interesting. But I have no idea where that came from, and it's gone nowhere since then. And he distinguished the unemployment insurance compensation cases by saying those involved individualized assessments, and when you make individualized assessments for some areas, and don't exclude religion, that's a problem. Now, Justice Scalia's decision is supported by a lot of actually powerful reasons. One is, he pointed out there's a uniqueness of the remedy. In other areas, you don't usually create exemptions from laws as a, as a judicial result. He said that's problematic. He said the inquiries that the test would normally require into things like sincerity and religiosity are problematic. How do you really determine religious sincerity? How do you really Aren't there constitutional problems in deciding what is religion and what isn't? He said, we're also concerned with the breadth of what the remedy is because anything can be religious. Uh, J Jason wanted me to mention a famous case called State versus Hodges in which somebody made the religious claim that he had to dress like a chicken when he came into court. Um, anything can have a religious claim to it. And there can be religious beliefs in anything. And that makes that makes the breadth of the kinds of claims in, in, incredibly wide, in fact, limitless, which may also means every single, po every single law out there is possibly subject to a free exercise challenge. Uh, he also argued that uh, applying the compelling interest test here would weaken the compelling interest test because courts wouldn't apply it vigorously. And in fact, he was right, because although Sherbert set forth that test, Every other free exercise case, except for the unemployment insurance compensation cases in Yoder, had turned out the other way, although a serious application of the compelling interest test would have led to different results. And finally, and finally, in an argument not raised by, by, by uh, Justice Scalia, but by, raised by Michael Schwartz, I'm not sure if he's here, and, and others, uh, creating this kind of exemption preferred religious conscience or religion ideology over other kinds of conscience, uh, secular, philosophical, et cetera. Uh, well, Justice Scalia has do did something in writing that opinion that has not been replicated in, the, in Washington since then, which is he brought together the left and the right 
who all sang Kumbaya on the steps of the Capitol and said, we have to overturn the Smith decision. There was one, by the way, one major exception to that, which was the Catholic bishops who didn't want there to be free exercise exemptions from anti-abortion laws because at the time it looked, how history repeats itself, that Rome might be overturned. But the Congress came together and passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was designed to create a compelling interest test statutorily that would have done what the Sherbert test had said it was going to do all along. The Supreme Court very quickly thereafter struck it down on federalism grounds as applied to the states in the Bernie case that this exceeded congressional power under Section 5. The groups came together one more time. Melissa was right at the center of it to try to get a son of RIFRA or daughter of RIFRA <laughs> law passed. But at this point, at this point, this alliance, which had looked so clear, really began to fall apart. Why? Because some of the folks in the alliance were really concerned with the religious liberty issue, protecting religion. Others were concerned with the equality aspects of what Sherbert was designed to achieve. And those are often very consistent with each other in a case such as a case called Holt versus Hobbs, which was decide, decided dealing with somebody's right to have a beard when they're in prison. But in other cases, dealing with civil rights or reproductive rights, the equality interest and the religious liberty interest are at odds with each other. So there was no ability for this agreement to come together to recreate RIFRA. The result was a very strange statute called RELUPA, which provided a compelling interest test as applied to the states only in the context of prisons and land use. So the, the landscape as we see it now is you've got RELUPA and uh, applying to the states only in the prison and state context. You've got state RIFRAs and you've got the RIFRA statute itself, which applies to the federal government and was used by Justice Alito in the Hobby Lobby case uh, as, as a vehicle to strike down the application of the Affordable Care Act's requirements to provide contraceptive insurance to, to, uh, to, to employees. So that's where we are right now. One of the interesting questions going forward is that there's been some empirical research that suggests that this equality notion that the compelling interest test was designed to accomplish uh, didn't work out that well either because like how legislators might be, might be inclined to recognize majority religions and not minority religions, judges also have that problem and may, uh, may not recognize with the same sort of credence uh, minority or, or, or unusual religious beliefs in the same way that they recognize recognize majoritarian claims. But that's where we are right now. You all can take the bar later on this summer. Why don't we give a hand to Bill <laughs> I feel confident of two things. One, we now can all pass the bar on that subject. <clears throat> two, he did blame me for the chicken case. So, <laughs> uh, all right, so ju just to fill in one additional piece that Bill sort of left off on, which was um, Hobby Lobby, and it probably will give us a little context into some of the claims that are being made now by progressives. Melissa, if you can just tell us a little bit, just very briefly about what happened in Hobby Lobby in terms of the standards, uh, the burdens a little bit, and some of the questions maybe that were left open, and I think it'll help us understand a little bit more of some of the more recent claims. Sure. So I'll just say a little bit about the actual merits of the Hobby Lobby case, and we can go into it in much more depth if you're interested later. But um, the Hobby Lobby case was brought by a, a craft store, uh, a commercial business that said that it had religious objections, its owners had religious <laughs> objections to providing certain forms of contraception that were required under the Affordable Care Act's contraception mandate. And as you may recall, that the mandate applies to most employers and says that employers have to provide certain preventive services to women cost-free. Um, so that set a new standard for most employers to have to comply with where they would include uh, contraception coverage in the standard package that was given to their employees. Well, Hobby Lobby objected to uh, providing certain forms of contraception uh, because they believed that it 
interfered with the implantation of eggs in the womb and thus for them by their definition was uh, an abortive patient not by the definition of the FDA, but by their own religious definition that was an abortifacient. And so they, they sued because they were not able to take advantage of an accommodation that was in place for religious entities that objected to the contraception mandate. So you had houses of worship and other closely associated religious entities entirely exempted from this mandate. And then you had religiously affiliated entities like religious schools and hospitals or social service organizations, uh, what was called the accommodation, which allowed them not to provide this coverage to their employees if they objected, but put the responsibility on the employer's insurance provider or their TPA, their third party administrator, to instead themselves extend this cost-free coverage to <coughs> women working for objecting employers. So in the case of the religious affiliated entities, women who worked for objecting employers would get the coverage just not from the objecting employer, rather from the employer's insurer or um, TPA. So Hobby Lobby challenged this. The Supreme Court ruled in a narrow ruling um, in favor of Hobby Lobby's claim, but they, the way they did so was to say that Hobby Lobby ought to be able to take advantage of this accommodation that was applied to religious entities, not commercial entities, that's why Hobby Lobby sued, that Hobby Lobby <coughs> ought to be able to take advantage of that accommodation too under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. They, the court held that, that yes, commercial entities like Hobby Lobby could uh, sue under RIFRA, and if they could prove that there was a substantial burden on their faith, then, um, then they could you know, move forward with their claim. The court, for the purposes of the claim, assumed that providing cost-free contraception coverage was a compelling state interest. But the court came to the view that the um, government was not advancing that interest by the least restrictive means, the, the, least res the means that had the lightest burden on religious exercise. And in order to meet that least restrictive means test, the government had to allow Hobby Lobby to take advantage of that accommodation that was extended to religiously affiliated entities. So the court ruled in that fashion so that Hobby Lobby's employees at least by the court's theory, would get the coverage um, at the same time that Hobby Lobby would be, object, be able to object and not provide it. Th that's the decision on the merits, but beyond the merits, some of the things that the court said about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act were very controversial. Um, Justice Alito, uh, I think, and the rest of the Supreme Court uh, said that RIFRA meant something, um, which was different than I, than I believe what Congress was saying when it passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It said that by enacting RIFRA, Congress went far beyond what this court has held is constitutionally required. But as the dissenters recognized, Congress intended only to restore, not to scrap or alter, the balancing test this court had applied pre-Smith. So you see this divide on the court between the majority saying RIFRA intended to create this new, more stringent compelling interest test than what the court applied pre-Smith. And the dissenters saying, no, you got that all wrong. You know why RIFRA was able to bring the right and left together. It was because it was only to restore the standard that had been in place pre-Smith. And so, you know, I think that standard um, that was in place pre-Smith, Bill said a bit about it, but I think that that standard had a history in which the court had taken, for example, burdens on third parties that were not beneficiaries of the exemption that was given to religious entities. The court had a tradition of taking those burdens seriously and invalidating accommodations or exemptions when they put an undue burden on third parties. Also, I think in the pre-Smith uh, uh, application of the compelling interest test, the one that Riffer restored, there was a recognition by the court that some entities are religious and some entities are commercial and or for profit. And we may need to recognize some distinctions there, not only because they're doing different things, one is at the core of religious exercise and one more at the periphery, but also because businesses can put a much more serious burden on third parties. They have more employees, control more of the, of the sector of the employment sector, and so we have to pay attention to those things. 
Um, so that's just a beginning to say that the pre-Smith compelling interest test uh, that I think brought the right and the left together with RIFRA was um, something that the dissenters recognized, but the court majority in the Hobby Lobby case uh, challenged, and that has created much more controversy around RIFRA than would have been was uh, at, certainly at the time that RIFRA was adopted. But also a more robust protection of religion than maybe somebody would have contemplated before Hobby Lobby came along, right? Uh, because of all the things you've described. Right. At the same time, there's still the availability of a, a separate free exercise claim under the Constitution, right? Somewhat right. more limited based on intentional discrimination, which is what was left after Smith. Exactly. Right? There's, the, RIFRA is statutory, not constitutional. Um, there is always the right to make a claim under the Constitution itself, which, as Bill said, it has a narrower kind of ambit of protection. Okay. And so with that framework in mind, let's, let's move ahead now to some of the ways that progressives are using either RIFRA or freestanding constitutional claims for progressive ends. I'm going to start with Liz. Um, let's talk a little bit about the work uh, of the Law, Rights, and Religion Project. Um, what's the goal of the project? How do you pursue that goal? And what has that meant in terms of the kinds of cases you've become involved with there? Sure. So, uh, I mean, this is a great panel for me to be on because our mission is really to advance a more um, progressive vision of, or a, a vision of religious liberty um, that is uh, guided by neutrality principles, plurality principles, many of the kind of earlier uh, principles that were um, kind of in our earlier free exercise case law, and um, and also ensuring that uh, that religious liberty rights um, apply uh, to non-believers as well. So we take a very um, uh, kind of broad view of our religious liberty rights that also recognizes limitations where those rights conflict with other fundamental um, uh, constitutional rights. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to talk, I think you mentioned earlier uh, that there has been a movement, and I think quite a successful movement, really to collapse our understanding of um, religious liberty, what religious liberty means to these, like, very um, narrow set of conservative religious beliefs having to do predominantly with sex, marriage, and reproduction. Um, and so what we, one of the many things that we've been trying to do um, over the past um, couple years has become more involved in providing strategic support uh, in, in um, cases that are uh, being brought for religious liberty rights outside of that narrow context. So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of start by saying that um, I would say the bulk of religious exemption cases right now look more like the Holt v. Hobbs case. They are being brought by um, a religious minority uh, practitioners for relatively modest accommodations um, to dress codes uh, within prisons, um, making sure that people have access to kosher and halal food, for example. Um, uh, but also to kind of talk about some of the more cutting edge religious liberty claims that we've been involved in. So I'm going to start with um, immigration. Uh, last year, a group of nine volunteers uh, affiliated with the Unitarian organization No More Deaths in Arizona were charged with federal crimes um, for providing humanitarian assistance to undocumented people. So eight of them were charged with misdemeanors for entering a national wildlife refuge uh, without a permit and leaving jugs of drinking water for people crossing the desert, um, essentially charged with criminal littering. Um, and charges against four of the volunteers uh, were dropped after they pled to civil infractions. However, one of the volunteers, Dr. Scott Warren, um, has additionally been charged with two felony counts of, quote, harboring an undocumented alien, um, as well as conspiracy to commit harboring. Um, and this could land him uh, in prison for 20 years. Um, why was he charged with that? Um, essentially, he walked into what's called the barn. It's a facility in the desert used by a range of humanitarian groups, found two um, undocumented men who had come there, uh, offered them um, some food and water and said, you can stay here for a couple nights. That's basically it. Um, and, and that was the subject of his charges. Um, he has brought a defense, actually all of the volunteers have brought defenses based on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. They asked that their um, humanitarian assistance is motivated by their deeply and sincerely held religious beliefs, um, and therefore it's entitled to protection 
uh, as part of their religious exercise. Um, our uh, organization um, uh, filed amicus briefs in a couple of these cases um, n uh, on, on behalf of neither party, but rather to kind of offer guidance to the court and how to treat these claims. And sort of out of a concern that these claims be treated with the um, seriousness that the claims brought by Hobby Lobby and Masterpiece Cake Shop for. So that's sort of our, our position, is that um, uh, these cases need to be treated with fairness and neutrality, regardless of where in the political spectrum they're being brought. And how has the court treated that um, argument so far? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so in terms of the four remaining misdemeanor cases, the, um, the district court issued a pretty demeaning opinion that uh, entirely failed to engage in the RFRA argument whatsoever, and in fact called it a modified Antigone defense. Um, and they have, <laughs> they have appeals. Um, Scott is um, currently, I think today, uh, finishing up the second week of his trial, so that's yet to be seen. Okay. Um, yeah, how about, how about uh, you mentioned also uh, some Georgia anti-war activists yeah, in the case absolutely. there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, another uh, case that we have um, been involved in involves a group of Catholic workers, um, members of the Plowshares movement, uh, including actually the, the granddaughter of Dorothy Day, um, who uh, broke into and staged a symbolic disarmament um, in a, a nuclear submarine facility. Um, and again, are being charged with a range of felony offenses. Um, and they were certainly deeply motivated by, um, by a religious commitment um, their commitment to promote, practice peaceful activism to carry forth the prophet Isaiah's command to beat swords into plowshares in an effort to promote peace and prevent nuclear war. Um, so they brought a motion to dismiss the charges um, based on, on that. And uh, I would say um, the, the court, uh, the magistrate court issued a report and recommendation that was uh, far more thoughtful than the Arizona district court had been. Um, however, uh, it, what it said was that, um, yes, this is a, a real religious belief. Yes, they were um, uh, sincere in, in practicing their religious belief. However, the court decided that um, the, the federal law had not, in fact, burdened them because based on their testimony, uh, it found that there was no, they had not articulated that they needed to break into the nuclear facility to host this um, action, that they could, in fact, have, um, uh, done the symbolic disarmament. They could have asked, essentially asked permission to enter the facility or to, to, to perform it somewhere where they would have been allowed um, to perform the symbolic disarmament. Um, and then furthermore, they also uh, the court also said that even if there had been a burden, that the, um, understandably, <laughs> that the government has a compelling interest in protecting its nuclear facilities um, and that there is no <laughs> less restrictive um, means to do so than to um, prosecute those who, who cut open a fence and enter it. Um, and you mentioned <coughs> the Antigone in that case? No Antigone okay. defense in that. No, okay. that was a, it, was a, it was a considerate opinion, which is what we wanted. Okay, uh, uh, terrific. Serene, um, from, from your perspective, are there any cases of this, this variety, progressive cases, using exemptions that you've been monitoring or involved with uh, recently? Well, I mean, I think so. Our, uh, I think, because the audience may not be familiar, I'll just say a couple of words about what Muslim Advocates is and Terrific. kind of situate the, the uh, discussion that way. So Muslim Advocates is a progressive secular civil rights organization um, that essentially the mission is to fight for the civil rights of Americans of all faiths um, or no faiths. Um, uh, but in that vein, we kind of engage in a variety of different cases that are in the sort of general religious liberty space um, in two ways, I would say. One way that we do it is that we try to use laws that are straightforwardly for the protection of people who are otherwise lacking protection. Like for example, RELUPA, which was just uh, mentioned earlier, has an institutionalized person's sort of arm whose intent is to protect the ability of people who are detained or incarcerated to practice their religion. Um, and uh, it also has a land use arm whose intent is to protect religious communities that are trying to build houses of worship or community centers or things of that nature to do so in the face of potential hostility or opposition. Um, and then there's a second sort of bucket of work that we do, which is more kind of amicus work so far um, in this vein of kind of explaining why a principle of religious liberty that is true to the origins of that idea doesn't mean 
a taking away of the civil rights of other groups in order to sort of privilege uh, a, a certain religious group's views or positions. And so in that context, we recently were involved, uh, along with Liz and Catherine actually, in an amicus brief in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, where we tried to argue basically that the religious princip liberty principles that you know form the foundation of that idea don't mean that you take civil rights away from one group because that actually comes back to hurt religious minorities who, if you look at kind of the way that those religious laws or statutes are invoked, are the most frequent users of those laws because they are the ones whose liberties are most frequently targeted and attacked. And if you erode civil rights protections for, say, a gay couple that wants to get married, that inevitably ends up coming back around and hurting religious minorities and so therefore not advancing the cause of religious liberty but rather you know, doing the reverse. Um, so that's sort of one area. Another area which I already gestured at that I just want to spend a couple of minutes on is this institutionalized persons area. Um, one reason that that's an area where we feel it makes sense to engage and, and we have a number of active cases as well as amicus you know, work in, in that space is that um, there are many ways in which it doesn't feel like you're stretching the law any further than it already is, right? It's just a straightforward application of RLUPA to a group of people who otherwise really have no access to protection for their ability to practice religion in a context where they tend to be under overrepresented, but also underserved. So uh, Muslim, uh, I, I don't have the, I actually, forgot my notes for this panel, so I'm kind of speaking <laughs> from memory, but there is a great percentage that I would have you know, quoted to you <laughs> that shows um, that uh, American Muslims, are, or actually Muslim prisoners, are kind of disproportionately incarcerated to the level, to their, you know, to the general makeup of, of the population that they form. So there's a, high, a relatively high percentage, sorry, I can't speak English apparently today, but there's a relatively high percentage of Muslims who are incarcerated and an extremely small number of Muslim chaplains. So the way that this works, and, and actually a very large black Muslim population that is incarcerated um, and that tends to see very frequent sort of um, discrimination from guards or just complete lack of understanding of their religious tra traditions and, and needs. Um, and also sort of overlaid on top of this kind of national security narrative that Muslims are somehow more threatening or dangerous and so they get treated in a way that's harsher um, and that requires them to sort of have to fight back more frequently. And so among like pro se Rolupa cases by prisoners, a very large, you know, a plurality I would say of those cases are by Muslim prisoners um, <coughs> who are trying to get sometimes very basic things like meals um, and sometimes more significant things like the ability to pray in groups the ability to have Jama'a prayer, which is the analog of church on Sunday, but it happens on Friday for Muslims. Um, and then sometimes other things like the ability to pray in groups. Um, so Muslims, for example, have daily prayers that happen five times a day. Um, and uh, when they are present in the vicinity of other Muslims, they, many of them believe that they should be praying together. And some prisoners place restrictions on that. And uh, we've, we are currently, representing someone who in the district court was pro se and we now represent him on appeal in the Sixth Circuit, who basically is, I would say, just a great lawyer, by the way, even though he's not a lawyer, but he, in his pro se pleadings in the district court, essentially had argued, like, look, if there's a bunch of, if it happens that there are, there's a football team that's playing on the field and it happens that, you know, all or even some of them are Muslim, they would be in football formation, it would be perfectly fine, and then the minute they stop to say their noon prayers, they would become a security risk. And that's just an absurd interpretation of why, you know, getting a few people together to pray somehow poses a security risk to the facility. So those are the kinds of cases that we've been engaging on. I don't, you know, there aren't really, we are still in the process of trying to get good decisions on some of those um, issues. I, I would say because the large majority of those cases are litigated pro se, there isn't really, you know, <laughs> there isn't a lot to work with. Um, I think it's very much an area that's still in development that we're kind of focusing on in order to try to make sure that we get good precedents and case law that protects the ability of prisoners to observe their religion. Um, when you do that, are you are you citing Hobby Lobby? Is, is, that, is, so, that, is that part of the strategy? So far, we are not. Um, we, you know, we've, I think, there, it's definitely been a conversation that we've been having internally. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, we're not like the ACL, you know, we're not like we're never gonna cite Hobby Lobby. 
but I think that um, we are trying to kind of remain in a space where we're not really taking a strong position one way or, or the other on, on Hobby, Lobby. Hobby Lobby, but we're trying to use a religious exemption that's in place, that's in a very different context, that has, that re where really the balance of power is kind of the one that you would want an exemption to assist. Um, and so we haven't, you know, I think there were a couple of cases where we thought that a site to Hobby Lobby would make sense, but then we found another case that we could cite that didn't have as much um, uh, potential to kind of, you know, uh, move things in a very negative dire <laughs> direction. Are, so, are, so, well, this will take us into that discussion. So I'm gonna come right back to this in one second. I just wanna yeah. ask Melissa, just, just to yeah. complete the picture a little bit, a case right. that I found fascinating that you pointed in my direction. Can you tell us about a pipeline in Lancaster <laughs> County, Pennsylvania, and a group of Catholic nuns yeah. called the Adorers of the Blood of Christ? Yeah, so they, these are just some other claims that are interesting and that are coming perhaps, you might say, from a more progressive impulse, but um, yeah, I know the labels don't exactly fit here, so I wanna say that for sure. It's just that it looks progressive to some people, but you know, it uh, may not be uh, asserted as progressive by the claimants. Um, Catholic nuns have objected uh, to oil pipelines running across their land uh, because of their interest in environmental protection and, and taking care of the earth, and they see this as being a conflict with their faith, so they have protested uh, the government's actually issuing certificates to allow companies to run oil pipelines across their property. And, um, you know, the nuns in their briefings will cite things like uh, uh, Pope Francis's encyclical uh, on uh, Laudato Si, saying protecting our common home and say this is our religious belief um, is substantially burdened by the government's action and you have no compelling interest uh, in um, suppressing our religious belief. Uh, they weren't the first to do this. Native Americans have also made similar claims about uh, oil pipelines running across their land, uh, have not had great success as far as I know with those claims, um, but uh, those are another genre. And if you wouldn't mind, Jason, me mentioning a couple of other claims that oh, might yeah, be of please. interest to the group. Um, we also have seen um, people who either want to serve or are serving in the, in the military, in the U.S. military, who are sick or Muslim and thus may wear a, a beard, a turban, or hijab, uh, challenging the U.S. military, saying that we want to serve, uh, but if we have to abide by your neutral, generally applicable garb and grooming requirements, we cannot serve because they do not allow us to wear um, you know, these accoutrements of our faith. So you have seen um, various lawsuits being brought. The ACLU has brought some, others have brought others, and with some success in allowing and pressing the U.S. military, various branches, to make accommodations to their garb and grooming requirements so that people can serve and keep their faith. And I think what we see there is an, sort of the ideals that Bill was alluding to earlier in building an, a more inclusive society, one that takes advantage of all the strengths of all our citizens and binds us together better. That is one of the goals of uh, religious exemptions, um, I think properly understood. Um, another um, case that is being litigated right now is a church has objected to the federal government's use of eminent domain to claim portions of its property to build the border wall um, because the church opposes it for religious reasons. Jason referred to this case at the outset. So this case is being brought by a Catholic um, diocese in Texas right now, and so people are watching that case closely as well. And there are others, but I just, they're, they're pretty wide swath of cases that are brought from people and may be viewed as, as progressive free exercise cases. Right, that's terrific, and, um, and, and sets the scene a little bit for, the, for more of the normative discussion here of whether this is a good idea, and I think maybe Serene's reticence um, kind of teed this up a little bit. Um, so you are, have refrained from citing Hobby Lobby. Correct? So far, and, yes. And, and is that because you are uncomfortable in reinforcing the fact that that is the use of exemptions in a very aggressive way, um, and that as we speak of all these things, uh, the use of exemptions is essentially anti-democratic, right? It is, it, is, it is the creating of an exemption from law and the concern that this would in fact reinforce all conservative efforts to use exemptions, which could undermine more anti-discrimination laws or could undermine 
uh, the ability to provide health care universally or requirements for vaccination, right? This is the, this is the primary danger of co-opting strategically um, very robust, what we would call conservative free exemption law uh, and using it for liberal ends. Is that a concern or have I loaded that question? <laughs> it's not a loaded question at all. Okay. No, of course, no, I'm, um, I mean, I think so. One of the concerns there actually is that there is some feeling and I'm not saying we're not coming down yet one way or the other, but there is some feeling that um, we are bound to lose, but possibly to lose in a way that gives more legitimacy to the analysis in Hobby Lobby that, you know, could kind of, if pushed to the extreme, become really just a free-for-all for any um, particularly conservative religious viewpoint or Christian conservative religious viewpoint that is familiar to people to win out. Whereas claims that are less familiar or that people have less sympathy or understanding of still wouldn't win because somehow the court would find. And this is a place where... You're thinking about minority religions. Right. right? Minority religions or you know, I think maybe we'll probably save this for later. Maybe this is not the time really to talk about this. But there's definitely... The court definitely seems to see or understand claims to religious free exercise differently depending on who's bringing them. And I think that's kind of a, a contrast that, you know, we've kind of talked about and written about um, when it comes to contrasting the Masterpiece Cake Shop with the Muslim ban, Trump versus Hawaii decision, for example, and the way the court looked at the issues in both those contexts where in one con I guess I'm talking about it. Is it okay? You're in it. You're okay, deep I'm in, in it. it now. You go. <laughs> I'm in it. I'm talking about it. Where, you know, in one context, the court, like, absolutely reached so far and deep into a place that the lower court or the Colorado courts hadn't gone and like well, that was not really part of the record that really wasn't an issue that the parties were raising to find one stray comment by a commissioner that it then used to create this entire <laughs> essential essentially this entire opinion about how this constituted um, animosity towards religion in a place where the comment itself is actually kind of ambiguous you know like even there so it's like one stray comment it's one commission it formed it's one commissioner it formed no part of the decision um, like no part of the basis for the decision, and it wasn't really, uh, you know, something that was at, at issue really in the party's kind of dis briefs or discussions. Whereas on the other hand, in Trump versus Hawaii, right. you have like a years long undisputed record of overtly, like any, not just any reasonable observer, but like anybody, <laughs> any reasonable or non-reasonable observer would say this is anti-Muslim animus coming from the highest place, you know, like from the official, like from the president, who never disavowed those statements, who in fact continued to make those statements. Um, and all of that was something the court was willing to just brush aside and say, no, no, that wasn't really, we're just, we're looking at the four corners. And when we look at the four corners, like there's nothing there about Muslim, I mean, that's not quite the decision, but you know, I mean, I think it just really highlighted that this is not really a legal analysis point, but it's just a point about the atmospherics and the context where the Supreme Court seems to be willing to look at claims one way when they come from one particular religious group and a different way when they come from other religious groups. And if that's the case, there's definitely an inherent danger to really pushing uh, sort of the Hobby Lobby decision um, to its extremes. Um, it, you know, if I can say one more thing, actually, on the flip side of that, though, there's definitely been, there's, there's this very interesting article by a really good friend of mine, actually, who is also uh, Brian Suchek. He's a professor at UC Davis who wrote this article about how um, you can think about using the Hobby Lobby decision or about bringing a challenge under RIFRA that would really test the limits of the Hobby Lobby decision, but in a way where you can't really lose. And the example that he uses and kind of focuses on is um, gay men who want to donate blood within a year of having sex with another man. So there's currently a prohibition on blood donations, not really gay actually, it's not the right, it's like, uh, it's called men who sleep with men. So it's basically if you've, if you're a man who has had um, sexual intercourse with another man within the last year, you are not allowed categorically to donate blood, which if you kind of scrutinize is kind of really on its face absurd because like if you're a heterosexual man who sleeps with many women, you're actually far riskier if you're donating blood than if you are. But anyway, it's kind of, it's a blanket ex um, prohibition that so far hasn't really been challenged. But his point was if there were to be someone in that category who firmly believes that, you know, as a matter of his religious faith, he, he should donate blood, um, that that would be kind of an incredible case to use Hobby Lobby for. Because it, I, guess, I think the way he puts it is that um, heads you, you win, tails the conservatives lose. Because, 
because whether because if you win, you win, and that's great. And this this person and that like you know blanket exemption would become more of a case by case risk analysis, which is the way that really usually it's done for blood donations. Um, but if you lose, it shows that it's not the case that any person can claim any belief whatsoever and say this is a religious belief. Like it shows that the court is going to be willing to go back to something like the Sherbert analysis, where you have to show the sincerity of your belief to show that it really is a religious belief. Like these kind of um, uh, criteria that seem to be eroded by the Hobby Lobby decision. So I'll put that out there and stop because I know other people. Okay, all right, so, so, so Bill, uh, how do you respond to that in, in terms of whether it's, a, whether it's a good idea for progressives to be pursuing the litigation or whether it's a high risk strategy because of some of the things that Serene has identified or any other reasons that we ought to refrain strategically? A, a little confessional here for a moment. I think Smith was right. Uh, I wrote an I wrote I wrote an article <laughs> I wrote an article called Hobby Lobby Bad Statutes Make Bad Law. Um, <clears throat> this area is rife with difficulty. It's going to lead to preference to majority religions in the same way that the legislative problem did. It prefers certain kinds of ideologies over other kinds of ideologies. I'd love to buy into the third party burden argument. If you took that seriously, the conscientious objection to war statute would be unconstitutional. And the third party burden argument again. Well, you, Melissa identified that you only get a religious exemption if you're not burdening third parties, but I don't think that the case law has been clear on that to any degree whatsoever. In the Jimmy Swaggart case, which was a, a pre-Smith uh, pre case, they wanted an exemption to sales taxes. There's no burden being imposed there. The court denied that anyway. There is a burden in some of the unemployment insurance ca cases because somebody else has to do that job if Mrs. Sherbert isn't going to. One case dealt with a guy who didn't want to work in an armaments factory. Uh, if he doesn't work there, somebody else has to. I don't think that's, there are a lot, there's some great scholarship. Melissa and others have made this argument that there, that should be a factor, but the court hasn't recognized it. And again, if you did, it would strike down conscientious objection to war. So I think it's a bad, I think it's a bad strategy. I think exemptions are bad. If that's true, then, and, and I also don't think that, it, I also think it's inevitable that Hobby Lobby cannot survive with the current level of protection that it has because if you took that compelling interest test seriously, it would mean that virtually every religious claim would win. And the courts aren't gonna live with that. They didn't live with that prior to Smith in the lower courts and the Supreme Court didn't, they wouldn't afterward. Um, so if you heavily litigate, it's, for me, if you heavily litigate free exercise clinics for progressive causes, it's a win-win. You win if, uh, if, if, the, uh, if the cases you talked about, the plaintiffs, the, the, uh, the, the religious claimants win on that, and you win if you blow up Hobby Lobby. But you have said in the past, right, that it might make more possible conservative claims uh, regarding, for example, vaccinating one's children, right? One could say, uh, my religion compels me to not engage in vaccination. And that would, that, that does not seem to be a goal of anyone sitting up here. I don't like that result at all, but Hobby Lobby, I mean, if you took Hobby Lobby seriously, it's gonna lead to that. I mean, Hobby Lobby said, we're going to defer burden, the religious claimant can define her own burden we aren't gonna look into sincerity and we certainly aren't gonna second guess the meaning of religion. Mm -hmm. Compelling interest only applies to the number of people seeking exemptions. Is there a compelling interest in vaccination? Sure there is. Is there a compelling interest in vaccination of your specific kid? Probably not under, 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 a, weighing of, under a weighing of compelling interest. So I don't think it's pushing the, the, you couldn't get more vibrant of a doctrine than Hobby Lobby announced. Okay, Melissa, I know you, um, probably have a, a slightly different view than Bill? Somewhat different view. One is just uh, to I, I make something clear. I don't, my view isn't that if an exemption causes any third party harm, then you shouldn't be able to get the exemption, period. I think what I would say is that burdens on third parties that are a result of religious accommodations have to be recognized and weighed out. And I think the court actually did that in cases pre-Smith, like in United States versus Lee, which involved an Amish guy who didn't want to withhold social security taxes on his employee. And, and the court said, no, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna accommodate you, in part because when you entered into the commercial sphere and y you then, you know, that was, that was a choice that 
and it has a burden on your employees and we're not going to accommodate that burden. So my, it's not, I'm not taking a black and white approach on that. I realize that gray has its own challenges, but I do think that there, there has to be an appreciation for third party harm um, and a weighing out of that against the religious interest. Um, sometimes third heart party harm is not sufficient to overcome a religious accommodation. I would argue that the court correctly <coughs> decided that religious organizations under Title VII can prefer people of their own faith in their religious entities, even though that does burden third parties. I think it matters what kind of entity is asserting the um, claim for an exemption as one factor, and the harm matters, but it has to be weighed out against other factors. Okay, so, well, I just want to ask you one question about the entity. Yeah. So, uh, presumably the distinction there would be between a, a not-for-profit, a, a church, or a not-for-profit corporation, or then, as in Hobby Lobby, a for-profit corporation. You would be most skeptical in yeah, that Yeah, I mean, right? I wouldn't close the door on any for-profit, but I would take the fact that it is a for-profit into consideration, both as, as a factor in and of itself and in terms of how the third party, in terms of the severity of the third party. Okay, party. so let's assume a world in which a restaurant decides that it wants to be a sanctuary restaurant. <coughs> in other words, it is decided as a matter of immigration law, it's no longer going to go through the I-9 process of checking uh, the background of the people who work there. That's just mm -hmm. as a matter of religious principle. Um, as part of the sanctuary movement, it's just not going to do that. Do you think that progressives in that case should be asserting exemptions on behalf of that of that litigant? Is that is that good short term strategy? Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, any port in a storm is a litigator. Um, but over the long haul, is that better or worse for a progressive vision of free exercise? You know, the kinds of claims that I would want to bring um, would be ones involving religious entities, churches, religious schools. And the like. Um, I think that that that's the kind. That's where I'd want to focus my effort in terms of pressing RIFRA claims. Okay, Liz, you 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 must deal with this in your organization all the time, right? Trying to decide what's both smart from a litigation mm -hmm. perspective, but also because you're balancing religion um, against equality all the time. Do you worry about making any of the arguments that you're making here, citing Hobby Lobby and some of the amicus briefs? whether that boomerangs at some point down the road, disturbs a balance? Yeah, no, absolutely. We think about it all the time, and we've um, had convenings where we bring people to hash, hash these questions out. So we're very concerned. But I think I, there, there are a few ways I think about it. One way I think about it is um, as almost a harm reduction framework. These claims are being brought. Um, they were brought long before we ever got involved in them, and, um, and, and in some cases were brought um, not very thoughtfully by folks who maybe uh, did have a commitment to LGBTQ and reproductive rights, but weren't necessarily, it was just a kind of regular criminal defense attorney who said, oh look, RIFRA, this is a thing I can use in my case, and weren't asking those tougher questions about how do I frame this in a way that isn't, that's going to at least minimize the risk of a boomerang. So one of the things that we do, for example, is we do a lot of trainings with sanctuary houses of worship um, because they're, of course, up to their eyeballs in, in, in planning and, and, and work, so don't have the, necessarily the bandwidth to do long-term strategic thinking about their future litigation strategies. So we have been talking to sanctuary communities um, to kind of help talk them through, heaven forbid, um, your community does get raided and your priest gets arrested for harboring someone who's in sanctuary in your church, um, how do you feel about bringing a claim that, for example, will only protect the religious members of your community and not necessarily um, the secular immigration activists within your movement? Um, is that something you're comfortable with? Where we can we can say, like, this is on the table and we, you, this might be a, a, a legal strategy that your attorneys or you want to take up, um, but we can kind of think through in advance some of those tougher questions about how broad are you really willing to go? Um, what is going to be the impact of your LGBTQ faith members? Uh, you know, how are they going to feel about these arguments? And kind of hash that out in advance. So, so a harm reduction approach is one way to sort of think about our involvement in these cases is making sure they are being thought in a kind of cross-movement way. Um, another one I've already sort of mentioned is this idea of neutrality. That you know, if we ha Hobby Lobby's on the books, it's it exists, and you know, 
we lost that battle. And so, um, you know, now are we going to just cede this territory entirely to the Christian right? Or are we going to say that this is a tool that's on the table that um, we're going to thoughtfully use? Um, and then the last thing that I would say we um, has been used not necessarily by our organization, but by others to, I think, um, pretty good effect is the use of, of uh, religious liberty arguments as a poison pill. We've sort of indicated this, but the use of um, uh, exemptions as a way to narrow the scope of religious liberty rights. So one way I mentioned to you, <coughs> was uh, uh, the satanic temple has done this to great effect, right. um, which is, for example, they go to a place where there's a Ten Commandments statue outside of the state hall, and they say, oh, I see, this is a place where everyone gets to put up their religious statues. Here's our goat-headed uh, deity that we would like to put up. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, the Ten Commandments comes down, and that's what they really wanted in the first place. So um, uh, we haven't really gotten involved in any goat head statues lately, but, um, <laughs> but it is an interesting strategy that I think has been successful. Yeah. Sri, do you want to add anything on that, on that point? If I, I would add maybe a couple of points uh, on that, uh, but kind of coming at it from a slightly different perspective, maybe responding more to kind of what Bill was saying earlier, is I think one concern, though, that we have and that we continue to kind of think through, like what's the best way to um, address that concern is that when there are no, no religious exemptions, that can actually sometimes equal uh, kind of the predominant or majority religion determining the cultural norms that then become what neutral is. And I, I do think that that's a significant concern. It's not, um, I don't think it always plays out that way, but I think that there are many contexts in which if there's like a, a majority religion or a majority culture that tends to kind of dictate what the norms are, the necessity for having an exemption actually does become more apparent because people who don't, whose like cultural norms are not the same or religious norms are not the same, end up being disfavored um, just of necessity. And so that, that would be one argument actually for making use of these exemptions and, and trying to claim them on behalf of people who are parts of the minority. And I think that the kind of equality principle is a good sort of umbrella principle for when to do that. Um, another sort of broad point that I was, uh, kind of wanted to make is that the sincerity test actually, I should kind of gloss that that raises its own problems because um, again, like the, the deciders of the sincerity test are usually gonna be much more familiar with certain forms of religiosity and not with others. And that can actually lead to sort of a, a different impact on people from minority religions whose sincerity is questioned because there's less familiarity with the form that their religion takes or the content of their religious, you know, belief, and that can actually kind of pose problems that would argue in favor of something more like a Hobby Lobby standard, you know, not, you know, I don't think that the Hobby Lobby standard where kind of anybody gets to assert any exemption is really the right one, um, but I, I just wanted to raise this question of like, if we make the sincerity test or the religiosity test too prominent in this analysis, it can also definitely create pressures on minority religions who would then want to support more kind of broader um, exemptions. Um, so I think that's, those really were the main things. Mm. Yeah, so, so, so based on those observations, it's, it's a good way to ask a question which we sort of left on the table, which is what, what happens if the court decides it wants to take a case to overrule Smith? That it actually wants to constitutionalize what's essentially in RIFRA. Mm -hmm. uh, then w what would your position be on that? If you were going to file an, uh, an amicus brief today, you're, you're, you're absolutely bound by what you say today. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I mean, I think you it's. Want to be exempted from that? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May I be exempted from this question? I mean, it's a very hard question, and actually, like, it, it partly, I think it partly, like, the reason this is a hard question, a question that maybe I don't have to answer now, is that when, <coughs> when the tides are going in one particular direction, it's not as important to like file an amicus brief or, you know, take that position. I think the harder question is like, if you're say in the criminal justice, like Scott Warren is there and he has available to him a defense, like his attorney is essentially obligated to make that defense yes. for him, you know, because he's a criminal defendant and like that's, uh, unless he actively waives it or decides not to uh, take it. And so that's a context where I think those questions are more kind of immediately prefacing. And that's my dodge of your question. Of, that was, like, so, really that was so deft. But, uh, um, <laughs> I, I wanna ask one, one more question. Um, I, I'm gonna ask it of, of Melissa. Um, which I think goes to what Serene was saying as well, and also to some of the discussions we've had earlier today and some of the other 
panels about uh, narratives and um, and the public opinion aspect of, of, of a lot of these discussions, not just the purely legal. Is there anything about a, a pattern of progressive free exercise advocacy? That is, if we're more aggressive about assuming the mantle of free exercise, hearkening back to Brennan, is there anything about that that is useful in reinforcing a progressive vision of the Constitution or a progressive vision of uh, our values in a way that's helpful? maybe to other debates, hmm. notions of freedom, notions of equality, right? Hmm. Taking the thing that is ordinarily associated now with the conservative side of these arguments and co-opting it in a way that has uses beyond just a religion debate or just a free exercise debate. Uh, well, I think that uh, what's been mentioned earlier by several of the panelists about the focus on the rights of the religious minorities um, can redound to the benefit of many other areas of law. I think what Serene was just saying about recognizing that a lot of times the majority, let's just use religion here because that's what we're talking about, the majority religion is actually exempted by the law itself. Its preferences, the way it does business, the way they live their lives, we're all taken care of, you know? I'm Baptist, I'm taken care of. But the person who is not, you know, practices some religion that's hardly known, um, not familiar in the United States, they're not taken care of. And they need to be taken care of because if our Constitution means what it says, it should, it, there are no second class fates in the United States. If I am accommodated and I belong to the majority religion, then the person who belongs to the smallest minority religion deserves the exact same accommodation. So I think really trying to focus on um, how you know there's a difference between our principles and our practices and the way that those impact minorities can redound to the benefit of uh, a lot of different areas of law. Bill, I know you've thought a lot about the public debate, culture wars, religion as part of that. Um, do you want to weigh in on that, on that subject, well, on, yeah. on whether there's something about the, the rhetorical posture of this that, that might be helpful in terms of other areas of constitutional belief? Well, I mean, I mean, certainly I think part of the problem with where the religion debate is, no matter what side you're on, it, it has been captured by the culture wars. We just think of this in terms of culture wars now. In a way, Sherbert wasn't a culture war case, and nobody thought about it that way. Hope versus Hobbes is not a culture war case. And I think this has distorted the way we might approach this because we're more concerned with the substantive um, gender issues and sexuality issues that are inherent in this. I mean, probably the best thing to do is just to look at this at the abstract. I mean, my, I, I, you know, M Melissa says it's powerful. I mean, certainly uh, recognizing minority religions is incredibly important. Why we would create a preference for somebody who has a religious belief against something over a, somebody who has a deeply held philosophical belief against something, I'm not sure. And religious exemptions does that. I mean, the idea that we're going to have the individual trump the government is a good thing in a lot of aspects to it, but certain classes of people doing it with certain kinds of ideologies, but not people from other ideologies, I think is problematic. Okay, terrific. So at this point, uh, if anybody has any questions, I ask you to come on up and um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, remind you to please make them questions, uh, not questions. statements with a question mark at the end. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and do you want to direct it to anybody in particular? No, to the panel. David Lillehaug from Minnesota. Some years ago in private practice, I represented groups of religious institutions attacking Minnesota's conceal and carry law oh. using the Minnesota Constitution. Many states have religious clauses in their constitution. Some incorporate conscience, not just religion. Mm -hmm. Some state Supreme Courts have explicitly not gone employment division versus Smith. What do you think of the strategy and tactics of dipping your toe in the water for progressive causes in the state court? Great question. Anybody want to, and, 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 and ties into the, uh, to an upcoming panel as well about state constitutions. I mean, I, I think it, for me, um, I think it would be the same kind of uh, approach that, you know, if you, if you see an avenue through your state constitution, through a state statute that, you know, might provide more protection than Smith does, then I would say, you know, use it. But in, in complement, in, in uh, response to some of the statements that have been made earlier, I think 
I would not, for example, want to cotton to a standard with um, s the substantial burden that that gives it the deference that, for example, Hobby Lobby uh, read the substantial burden, saying it, substantial burden basically is whatever a religious group says it is, when I think both Congress and the pre-Smith case law says that substantial burden, yes, we, we pay close attention to what the burden a religious group says is on its practices, but we also reserve room for legal judgment mm -hmm. in whether this constitutes a burden on religious practice. If we don't do that, then I think the, the free exercise test gets all out of whack. So I would say let's articulate standards that we feel like are the right standards to apply to progressive or conservative claims and you know, apply those standards and argue those standards and don't just take advantage of standards that we think are actually not correct. Anyone else, uh, other observations? Okay, All go right. ahead, sir. Uh, Ian Milhais with Think Progress. Uh, three words I'm surprised I haven't heard yet are Dunn v. Ray. Oh, yeah. Um, and like Dunn, for those who aren't familiar, is the case where Alabama had a rule that if you were a Christian and you were going to be executed, you got your chaplain in the execution chamber. And if you were a Muslim, you did not get your chaplain in the execution chamber. It's a pretty straightforward establishment clause violation. And the Supreme Court decided, or the five Republicans decided to use this as the vehicle to say that they had theater tickets that night and they weren't going to be bothered to read a death penalty petition that they were just going to deny anyway. Um, and so I think there's two ways to read that. One way to read that, you know, you brought up the Satanic Temple cases and the, the premise of the Satanic Temple cases is that there is a rule of neutrality and you have to treat every faith the same. And I find it impossible to believe that if Alabama was denying people a Catholic priest, that the Supreme Court would have ruled the way that it did. The other way to read it is that they're willing to apply, you know, Holt v. Hobbes style um, accommodations to minority religions when they don't care that much. But when they care, when they've got theater tickets that night, then they, then they won't. And, and so my question is, like, the whole premise of this panel seems to be that these guys are acting in good faith. What if they aren't? First of all, you didn't hear that from me. That's an establishment clause case. I mean, uh, not a not a free exercise not a free exercise I'm case. Sure. But I think, but it shows it shows what I think a lot of folks here are saying is that. You know, part, partly Sherbert was in response to the idea that legislatures may inadvertently not pay attention to minorities, but, but part of the problem with exemptions, which was supposed to cure that, is that judges are going to fall into the same trap. So you end up having an exemption system that doesn't cure what, the real pro what, what part of the problem was that you were going after, and it creates a number of other kinds of serious issues on the side. So, yeah. I mean, one thing I was very heartened by is there was a pretty strong outcry against Dunn v. Ray. Um, I know a number of us immediately spoke out, and and some, you know, to their credit, conservatives' voices were raised as well as progressive voices, um, people who defend religious freedom on the conservative side as well. So I appreciated that, and I think you know the continuing discussion on the court, and I won't, we can go into it later if you wish. But there's a continuing dialogue, and I think they heard that and felt like their feet were being held to the fire in some respect. And so that's a good thing um, amidst the problems, the very real problems that you're raising. I mean, if I can actually, one uh, other thing on this, which definitely like the Dunn versus Ray case was like a huge um, deal for us in part because it wasn't even, it was the 11th Circuit had already granted a stay and the Supreme Court took the extraordinary measure of reversing the grant of the stay by the 11th Circuit because it just kind of, but, uh, but I, I should clarify to be fair though, it's not that Alabama had a rule that the Christian chaplain could be there and the Muslim chaplain couldn't, it's that there's one chaplain who's the official chaplain of that facility and he happens to be Christian and so of necessity, and I think this goes to a point that I was making a little bit earlier, like of necessity, any you know, um, prisoner who doesn't subscribe to the faith of that particular chaplain is then dis disfavored and disadvantaged and uh, you know, I think Elena Kagan had, Judge Elena 
Justice Kagan had a great uh, you know dissent that kind of raised and highlighted some of those points. Um, but then I think you know the step that the Supreme Court took later was that there was a similar case that was presented to them that had a Buddhist person, and, <laughs> and then they didn't grant the stay in that case, or you know they. Um, I can't remember what the precise posture was, but they sort of said, no, this is an Establishment Clause vi violation, or, or, or it raises kind of a, the possibility of an Establishment Clause violation that needs to be scrutinized further, and so they granted the stay. And so um, uh, then a number of State Department correctional like, you know, systems then just said, okay, no chaplains in the chamber. And so like, I'm, I'm only saying this just to say, like, this is, it's not something that like, stops at the Supreme Court. It's something that actually trickles down further where you know you might end up getting the good judgment but then that's not actually the outcome that helps the prisoners that you are trying to help instead it's an outcome that ends up making everybody who's now about to be killed by the state not have a spiritual advisor next to them while they're doing that so and just to underscore it, it, the fact that there was only one chaplain that's what made it an establishment clause case rather than a free exercise case rather than a rule that was already on the books i Which think that, that the, mm, you're Bill, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was going to answer. My yours. understanding of the case, we probably should ask Ian to talk about it. But, uh, uh -huh. but the, uh, but it, it wasn't a claim that you had a free exercise right to have your own right. chaplain. Right. Simply that yeah, it was the one claim there. that yeah. was brought. On, the it underlying was claim wasn't it was a different. Clause. It, yeah. yeah. Okay. Next up. Hi, I'm Amy Thompson from the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office, and we've been litigating to challenge the religious and moral exemptions to the contraceptive mandate that the federal government's put out. And one of the points that they've made repeatedly throughout the litigation is that RIFRA grants them essentially affirmative rulemaking authority. And I was curious what the panel thought about that, both legally and, and, and as a matter of policy. I, uh, can you uh, have a question? Yeah. RIFRA, who is arguing that RIFRA grants them affirmative rulemaking authority? The federal government. So in justifying oh. the new religious exemption right. to the contraceptive right. mandate, they're saying that they get authority to do that oh. both from the Women's Health Amendment, but as a separate argument, they say that RIFRA grants them the authority to create the new religious exemption um, as, well, as a rule under yeah, the APA. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't know. I, I would want to hear Bill's view on this, too, being a, the role you played in the Clinton administration. But um, I, I think I disagree with the Trump administration's rule. Let me be clear about that and, and the way that they've uh, uh, altered the exemptions. But RIFRA is a... a a law that binds the federal government that it can take into, I think it can take into account when it's making policy and law. So, you know, I, I, I think that that, and I think that, you know, the Obama administration took a similar point of view. So I wouldn't see that as being a problem, I don't think. No. Yeah, um, particularly with the um, Masterpiece uh, Cake uh, case, uh, and the Hobby Lobby case, and I think this is something that Ian and uh, Melissa Rogers was getting into, uh, the shift from the days of uh, Sherbert with Justice Brennan and, uh, the, uh, and the establishment of RIFRA to help protect Native American religions. Right now, uh, the courts, especially the Supreme Court, are protecting the politically powerful religions, the, uh, the more majority religions, rather than the minority and less protected religions. It's, it's a total flip of how it used to be. And uh, basically, with the Masterpiece Cake Theater and the Hobby Lobby, you have um, a, um, white uh, evangelical Christians uh, who uh, say that they need protection, even though that they are one of the largest uh, religious groups in the country and have quite a lot of political power. And those are the ones who are being protected, rather than the original thinking behind RIFRA and Justice Brennan's opinion and Sherbert protecting uh, minority religions from the tyranny of the majority. Is there a question? No, I, 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 what's your opinion? Is that? <laughs> 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 Opinions on that? <clears throat> I think we covered that ground. You, you cover, I mean, yeah, but. Yeah. To be fair to the other side, they're a minority if they didn't win their political view. I mean, um, it may be that, they're a, that they're, a, they're a religion with a lot of political power, but if they lost in the political process, they lost in the political process. Yeah, but, but they didn't 
I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm not going to disagree. Okay, let's move on to the next. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Let's move on to the next question. Um, uh, hi, my name is Jeff Blackwell. I'm litigation counsel with American Atheists, and we actually are taking a number. We have one lawsuit in Arkansas right now that involves both a free exercise and state level RIFRA claim. Um, just as an aside. Um, but I'm curious, because um, I'd love to talk to each of you, but um, I'm curious about your opinions on how Hobby Lobby and Hosanna Tabor interact with each other, particularly in reference to your question involving a, um, a sanctuary restaurant. Um, and maybe they have ministerial positions and, and whatnot. So I, I'm curious uh, to hear your opinions on that. Anybody? Um, a sanctuary restaurant asserting a ministerial ex ministerial exception? If, if they were, as Hobby Lobby is, a closely held religious mm -hmm. for-profit corporation. Mm -hmm. Could they have a minister that was subject to the ministerial Could they claim exception? the positions were ministerial and therefore the courts had no ability to enforce anything with regard to their decisions regarding those positions? Yeah. Um, go ahead, Bill. I'll while you're going to. Oh, well, I mean, the problem is, is in the, in Hosanna Tabor, I mean, Ch Thomas wants to just defer to the organization to define, so, it's, and, and that's, and the same way that Alito wanted to defer to the religious believer to define burden. So what we're getting from this area is not just vibrant protection, we're also letting the claimants define the prerequisites yes. necessary to do that without court, <coughs> literally without court review, just complete deference. I don't think that's sustainable. I think the example that you're using is one that that might be questioned, but if you do start questioning it, I mean, we've alluded to this, I think everybody has, the questions of what's religiously sincere. I mean, do you want to cross-examine a religious believer on their sincerity? Do you want to cross-examine your restaurant owner as to whether or not this person is actually doing ministerial work or not? That's pretty ugly. Uh, and the courts have stayed away from that, I think, for a good instinct, but I also think that that shows part of the problems with creating this special kind of benefit because it becomes self-defining as to who gets it. And oh, you know, mm. can, oh sorry. <laughs> can I just add, in the, I'm just thinking back on the Hosanna Tabor case, and I guess I just remember a lot of language, I'll have to go back and look at it with this in mind, about religious communities, religious communities being able to choose their ministers and mm -hmm. chart their way, and I don't remember um, something that would easily lend itself to the to the commercial context that you describe. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I just think once again, uh, my instinct would be to look much more favorably upon a religious organization asserting these kinds of um, special treatment than a commercial organization. Um, I, I don't uh, particularly, I'm not going to kind of weigh in on, on that specific question, but to something that Bill was saying before, I do think it's worth thinking, though, like at a more kind of abstract level, that there is a difference between allowing the sincerity part of it to be defined by the person and the burden part of it to be defined by the person. So, like, I actually think that there could be a sort of principled way to... Um, and RIFRA kind of requires both. Right. So RIFRA requires both that the... the RIFRA requires both... And after Hobby Lobby, I guess you're deferring to, to people on both. And that's what I think is so crazy about Hobby Lobby. But whereas I think that, you know, the sincerity question does feel like one that's more appropriately, you know, that deserves deference, I guess, because people hold many different kinds of religious beliefs in different ways that are very difficult to scrutinize or understand. Whereas the burden test does seem like it can lend itself to more objective inquiries and, and that the real danger comes from complete deference on the burden question. Um, so I'll just pose that, you know, as, a, as something to think about. Let's try to go uh, rapid speed here with these last yeah. three gentlemen and their fine questions. Go ahead. Hi, Who are uh, you? Sean Foley, I'm uh, obviously 2 l at Yale. Um, I had a question, it's kind of two-part on the issue of non-discrimination and sincerity that we're discussing, which I think is kind of what brings most of us to this room. On the one hand, we want to, or at least some of us want to accommodate religious minorities who are most adversely affected by majoritarian laws, as in a Muslim prisoner, say, who has a beard for religious reasons and cannot do it because of religious prison policies. And on the other end, to the extent that we allow those accommodations, we do not want people to be able to weaponize it to discriminate against gay people or women and various policy measures. Um, and I think the sincerity piece is, is very problematic. It's, I would argue it's unconstitutional. And it, puts majoritarian people often in positions to determine 
whether a belief is valid and sincere and that will often cut against minority groups. Um, so I'm wondering how we reconcile on the front end again wanting to support minority religious believers but on the other hand ensure that the weaponization is not taken over by the right wing to affect again particularly LGBT people and women um, in important policy matters. Oh, are we going one by one? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, why don't we, yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a good question. I think from my perspective, RIFRA, free exercise protections are for everyone, not just for religious minorities. Um, they, they, you know, people have to be able to make a free exercise claim, and then the question is whether it's honored or not. And I think in the, que in the situation where you have a free exercise right being asserted against another civil right, you know, non-discrimination on the basis of LGBT or the like, then, you know, the, the analysis should, uh, should take into account what kind of entity it is, of course, what the law, what law applies um, and binds. But one of the things that I think is, is special about <coughs> civil rights law is, for example, um, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, uh, the interest of civil rights law there isn't that the um, gay couple should be able to find some place in town where they will be served. It is a public accommodation, so that right is to be served equally by all who are covered by the public accommodations law. And so some courts, I think, and have found correctly in situations like that, there is no less restrictive means to promoting that compelling interest than requiring all public accommodations mm -hmm. to observe that standard. And so for me, it, it often does not work if, you know, it's hard for me to think of situations that work when you would say, uh, in the commercial context, well, we'll just refer them to somebody else in town. That defeats the aim of the civil rights protection, the public accommodations protection, and I think in that case should be viewed as something for their, where there is a compelling interest and no least restrictive alternative and should not be accepted in, in a, like a masterpiece cake shop case. So I think that that can be, you can have, you can still say you're doing the strict scrutiny analysis, but it's not, um, Civil rights of LGBT people aren't uh, aren't sacrificed to the religious interest in cases like that. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Joshua Houston, Texas Interfaith Center. Um, is there any hope for a progressive vision using the Establishment Clause rather than for exercise? <laughs> <laughs> not in immigration, there's not. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I mean, I think this is a topic for a whole nother discussion. Yeah. But I think, but, no, I appreciate your question because I think the establishment clause also, I mean, while the free exercise clause, there's overreaching going on there, there's an effort to shrink the establishment right. clause at the same time. Both are coming together in a, in a storm that's very threatening to religious liberty overall. Mm -hmm. So I think progressives and all people of faith ought to be able to speaking out in favor of a robust establishment clause because when the government promotes religion, it actually is uh, harmful to th not only the religions that aren't promoted, but the religion that is promoted because the government then starts controlling that religion and its messages. Um, and also, you know when the government promotes religion, it's gonna be promoting the majority religion. It's not gonna be promoting the minority religion. So it's a de facto preference if you allow the government to promote religion a lot hangs in the balance. So I think I'm all for asserting a robust establishment clause and doing so myself as a religious person, not just good for everybody's conscience and, and civil liberties, but for religion and the majority religion even. Okay, last question, we'll wrap up with this. Hi, Mark Heron from the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, in a hypothetical future in which the progressives controlled both houses of Congress and the White House, um, <laughs> Imagine that you are a panel testifying in front of the House or Senate Judi Judiciary Committee. What should Congress do to fix RIFRA short of repealing it? What are the key things that Congress should do? I think allow an inquiry into burden. I agree with, I, I agree with that. Uh, try to figure out objective ways to measure burden. I would soften the compelling interest test to a uh, to a softer test, maybe similar to uh, the test on religious accommodations by employers mm -hmm. uh, in, in TWA versus Har and that that's one couple of things I might look at. 
I might differ a little bit on that last one, but just in kind and in degree, not kind. But um, the I also think that in the reference legislative history on the Senate side, there is a provision about. Um, well, RIFRA should protect claims, aid, claims of government aid like Sherbert versus Verner, but not beyond Sherbert versus Verner. So I think it is a mistake and wrong, I think, when the government would say, as it has said, that there is a R RIFRA violation when the government won't extend a government grant to a religious organization, um, even though it would not you know, comply with non-discrimination ordinances that apply to that grant. I don't think that is a substantial burden under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I think it's there in the legislative history from 1993 and ought to be expounded upon as, as a problematic and improper use of RIFRA. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Uh, I'll be chewing on Bill's criticism of the third party harm rule, but I, I would say that I do think, you know, ha having some clear mechanism for which to um, not just weigh the, the uh, re person requesting the exemption in the government interest, but a robust way to look at third party harms. And I would say not just because those har the secular harms are important, um, it, it, when, you know, I am forced to essentially give up a right and subsidize someone else's religious uh, belief through an exemption. It's not just that I'm giving up that secular right. I think it's actually a religious harm as well. So um, I think that's one way to sort of conceptualize why the third party harm I think is so important in this context. Um, and, and I would say yeah, trying to figure out a way to kind of add that to the mix would be good. All right, I want to thank our terrific volunteers. I want to thank all of you for being here. Most of all, I want to thank our panel. <laughs>